Okay. <clears throat> so we'll start our presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today's presentation is about uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what are the current kind of a literature, uh, how to go ahead, what are the things, and uh, how do we kind of an interpret the things. So there are two terminology which is very important. One is hypoxemia and hypoxia. When we talk about hypoxemia, the hypoxemia means low oxygen tension in the blood. When we are talking about hypoxemia, that means I am talking about PaO2 in arterial ABG. And when I am talking about hypoxia, hypoxia is reduction of oxygen at the tissue level. It is at the tissue level uh, in the sense when we are actually trying to check the oxygenation at the tissue level. Uh, hypoxia is at the blood level. So like we are doing uh, pulse oximetry where we see a saturation less than 92, it is called as hypoxia. But there are different type of hypoxemia if you take care of what you called as tissue uh, oxygenation. So what are those? Okay, so what are those? So we have hypoxic hypoxemia, that means oxygen is low. The oxygen in the blood is low, that's why uh, the oxygen which is reaching the tissue is less. It can be related to pneumonia, it can be related to uh, decreased partial pressure of oxygen at the high altitude. Then we have anemic hypoxia. That means the oxygen carrying capacity is low, that the blood is not able to carry oxygen to the tissue. So what is an oxygen carrying capacity? So oxygen carried away by a hemoglobin or percentage of hemoglobin, an amount of hemoglobin. So that means we have a less hemoglobin to carry out the uh, oxygen to the tissue level and if it is very very low then what happens is the tissue is not able to utilize the oxygen sometimes some hemoglobinopathy is where oxygen is linked to the hemoglobin very kind of a covalently when it's not released there also you see the oxygen concentration is good but it's not able to utilize by the tissue so like carbon monoxide poisoning then we have a circulatory hypoxia that means everything is good in the blood oxygen is glued we have good hemoglobin, but we are not able to perfuse the tissue. It could be because the tissues are edematous or blood vessels are gone or they are leaky or they are very small, constricted. Then you started having a circulatory hypoxia. And then histotoxic hypoxia. That means an acute kind of an injury. So histotoxic could be related to cyanide poison. That means there is a mitochondrial failure. And that's why the tissue cell is not able to utilize the oxygen. So we have decrease oxygen in the blood and at the tissue level we have hypoxic, anemic, circulatory and histotoxic. There are few <clears throat> equations we commonly use in our practice uh, when we are talking about oxygenation and ventilation. I am not going to go detail of this formula but these are something which we should know. The partial pressure of inspired oxygen, arterial oxygen contains as we said oxygen carrying capacity then we have a mixed venous oxygen saturation or a content then we have oxygen consumption, BO2, and oxygen delivery, DO2. So what exactly is consumption and delivery? So ultimately, everything in the body depends upon delivery and consumption. So if there is an imbalance between the two, you can have a lot of other tissue and one of uh, other issues. One of them is a shock. Okay? Oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery can be calculated through this. So what is oxygen, what is oxygen delivery? Delivery is oxygen carrying capacity, which is this or arterial oxygen content plus cardiac output. What is consumption? The difference between arterial oxygen content and mixed venous oxygen content. Mixed venous is the blood which is there in the right ventricle. So that means the blood is coming out of the heart through the aorta. It is completely utilized. Whatever the oxygen the body wants to utilize is utilized and ultimately returned to the right ventricle. So the difference between how much oxygen is circulating to the artery and ultimately left behind into the blood in the right ventricle, that means that much of oxygen is used in the body. So the oxygen consumption is cardiac output into arterial oxygen content minus mixed venous oxygen content. So a uh, few things which are very important when we're talking about ARDS, oxygenation index. Initially, we used to talk about uh, PF ratio. Now we talk about oxygenation index. What is oxygenation index is FiO2, uh, the percentage of oxygen the child is on, mean airway pressure into 100 divided by PO2. So basically, it's an oxygenation index. The most important thing here is it is not a PF ratio. It's a 
So in a PF ratio, it doesn't account into the amount of ventilatory pressure the child is on. But in oxygenation index, it's negate that issue and you are also including the pressure or mean airway pressure. Oxygen saturation index in the uh, unit where you don't have a ventilator or there is a child who might be on the early ARDS or a mild to moderate ARDS, but they, they are not on ventilator. They are just on oxygen or high flow oxygen or uh, NRM or increased percentage of oxygen. We use oxygenation saturation index. What happens is we use FiO2 and saturations. And here also, when we are talking about the pressure and we don't have a PO2 value, we try to, because you are getting a PO2 values, you have to repeatedly pick the child. So if you are not able to pick the child, you can actually see whether the child is improving or not with saturation uh, monitor. So uh, what I was talking about is uh, different, okay? So oxygen saturation index, in spite of PO2, you talk about SpO2. So uh, long back in 1967, somebody, Ashberg, called it an ARDS. And uh, what happened is he found out there is a tachypnea, hypoxemia, lungs are really bad, consolidated. And there was a lot of research happened over the next 20 years to actually coin this term and identify what exactly the pathophysiology is. So American and European League uh, in 1994 gave some kind of a accepted criteria which was utilized for a longer time, but then we have a Berlin definition in 2013. But ultimately, uh, there are very much fallacies and it was not possible to extrapolate this, this uh, definition all over the world. So we started use that, using PALIC, which is a league against an, uh, ARDS, pediatric ARDS definitions. We'll talk about it. So this was initial definition. So, uh, uh, so again, uh, these are old definitions. There are timings includes, there is an oxygenation, chest X-ray findings, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and some risk factors. And you can see there is a, some kind of a modification happening. Initially it was less than 300, then become 200 to 300 PF ratio, acute lung injury and slowly, slowly it started evaluating. And ultimately we landed up into this PRDS definition. So what happens here, so here we exclude the perinatal insult, uh, what we call as Hallen membrane disease or uh, uh, prematurity related to ARDS, we remove that timing. So we don't call it an ARDS, so there is an acute insult. Uh, within seven days, you are having a feature suggestive of, uh, I would say, ARDS. And... Uh, there is no cardiac failure or cardiac failure or fluid overload is not able to explain that. Uh, chest imaging is consistent with acute pulmonary parenchymal changes and main thing is about oxygenation. So it is both invasive as well as non-invasive. In a non-invasive mechanical ventilation, what there is a full face mask bilevel ventilation or CPAP where you are using more than five centimeter of pressure and you are having a PF ratio less than 300 or a cell. Saturation, so PF ratio is PO2 by FiO2. SF ratio is saturation by uh, FiO2. So here you don't have to actually calculate or do an ABG. So this is early or non-severe stratification of periodics. When we start invasive mechanical ventilation, that means uh, the most important thing is you don't need mechanical ventilation to call it as an uh, ARDS. Even in the non-invasive mechanical ventilation also, you can actually calculate this PF ratio and SF ratio and say that if they are on any form of a pressure, CPAP or bi-level more than 5 cm. Invasive mechanical ventilation, very simple, mild oxygenation index between 4 to 8, 8 to 16, moderate, more than 16, severe. And then as we calculated uh, Oxygenation saturation index, same 5 to 7.5. So, so stratification depending upon whether we use saturation or PO2. There are certain special population which might be related to chronic lung disease, left ventricular dysfunction, genetic heart disease. We don't utilize the similar criteria for them. But ultimately at this level for all of you, we utilize this criteria for most of the patient. Again, uh, there are, uh, I would say, certain at-risk pediatric patients who can go to the ARDS. So the other thing remains same age, timing, non-invasive mechanical ventilation. We see nasal bypass. Those are on more than 40% FiO2. And just achieving a saturation, they're at high risk of going to the ARDS or uh, fluorid ARDS. Those who are on high flow oxygen candela, you can see 
less than one year, they are requiring two liters per minute, four liters, six liters, eight liters, depending upon the ages, they are at high risk of developing into acute respiratory distress syndrome. Invasive mechanical ventilation, those are having OI less than eight, uh, OI less than four, or OSL less than five, and saturation more than 88. So what do you mean by that? That you don't wait for them to satisfy the criteria for ARDS. What happens is you try to identify them early that these kids are developing ARDS and intervene early. So to understand that, what happens, there are three zones of lung. So zone one, what is happening in the zone one is you can see the lungs are really, really uh, alveolar are big. They are big balloon. And what is happening is they are causing a pressure over the vessels. So because of that, what happens? The VQ mismatch goes up and your functional residual capacity is more. And let me tell you, this is happening differently at different alveoli. You want to get in a single lung, all three mamas alveoli. Normal, where what happens is the pressure gradient difference between the arteries and uh, so arteriolar end and the venous end are maintained and alveoli is at a normal zone. Most of the time, we want lungs to be in the normal zone. Atelectasis, what happens is the vessels are big, the alveolar are small, and there is a complete shunting. That means blood comes here, goes here without getting oxygenated. And here, what happens is because you're causing a shear stress on the blood vessels, the pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. So what is the pathophysiology of ARDS? So similarly, as for the other, it could be direct or indirect. So there is a pulmonary capillary endothelial inflammation and injury. So alveoli, got, so uh, capillaries which are near alveoli uh, got inflamed. Then the capillaries get increased. So the fluid comes out of them. Then simultaneously because of the ventilation or a disease process or infection, there will be a lung parenchymal injury. And because of that, this pores will become bigger and large proteins will come out. They will form there. They will stay in the interstitial. They will cause some edema. And because of that, the interstitial space will become thicker. We'll talk about it. You can see. So this is a normal layer and this is a bad lung layer. You can see this layer has got thickened. So you have a highline membrane form. And then you have direct injury where there is a lot of alveolar macrophage, tumor necrosis factor, IL-6, IL-10. And you can see these are the blood vessels. And what is happening is there is a neutrophilic predominance. There is a process where actually a lot of edematous interstitium as there is a lot of fluid or proteins coming out of this alveola. And they are making this more and more thick. And this air-spaced alveola are more uh, kind of uh, flooded with a lot of bad materials like highline membrane. You have a lot of inflammatory markers, fluid, and it's becoming stiff and stiff. Same thing is a lot of cytokinins. And we know in COVID, we learn there are a lot of bad cytokines which sit inside the alveola. And what happens is as we lose an integrity, again, more and more things come in. And once we ventilate these kids, we are caught causing a more injury for the ventilatory induced lung injury. What happens at the pathophysiological level, there will be an impaired GAT exchange because of this pathology, decreased compliance that lungs will become stiff and there will be an increased pulmonary arterial pressure or pulmonary hypertension. And all these things causes a bad AIDS. So as we discuss VQ mismatch, depending upon that, what part of the lung you're dealing, are you dealing with the overinflated lung where the uh, pH is more? Are you dealing with the collapse or consolidated lung where there is a VQ mismatch, the blood comes and shunts and there will be a shunt uh, causing hypoxia. Dead space, why dead space is because it is completely flooded with the bad material or it is basically collapsed. So there is no ventilation happening there or there are places where the pH or pulmonary arterial hypertension is so high that only air is going into the alveola but not blood. Compliance, so we know that uh, the lung is kind of a sponge-like structure and once more and more fluid accumulates there, it becomes stiff, so stiff that it's, it's kind of a very, very difficult to inflate them. And all of us, we know any child with ARDS, when we bag them, we require a lot of pressure. Now, simultaneously, if you see any child who is coming from surgery without any bad lung, you could see that the lungs is easily inflatable. Increased pulmonary arterial pressure, as I, as I told you, there are two, three things happening simultaneously. The alveoli are big, so they are compressing on the blood vessels. Second thing is they are hypoxic. If they are hypoxic, 
the hypoxia is a very potent stimulus for the blood vessel the arterial blood vessels or pulmonary blood vessels to constrict and it again causes hypoxia and then pulmonary atrial hypertension it goes on together and if you landed up in right ventricular failure because of sepsis infection so then it actually exacerbate the effect of right pulmonary atrial hypertension so it is a heterogeneous disease that means it's not happens i mean though x ray we see oh this is involvement of the medial part upper lobe but this is a heterogeneous disease and it involves any part of the lung and depending upon how much pressure we are the heterogeneity changes because we don't know probably the alveoli here requires more pressure and the alveoli here require less pressure so it is a hetero each alveoli is a different unit but what we will, what we do is we try to understand at what pressure we are able to achieve maximum frc without minimal pressure with less minimal pressure so that oxygenation is maintained as i told there are two types of ards direct and indirect direct means there is a direct insult it could be aspiration pneumonia drowning and most of the ards direct lungs are consolidated they are bad they are kind of a stiff in indirect there is an indirect it could be a pancreatitis it could be sepsis induced lung injury that there is no primary pneumonia and here most of the alveoli are collapsed or alveolar collapse is predominant and these are the lungs where we can actually have recruitment maneuver which can be helpful because we can inflate the lung which are collapsed so these are the phases of ards initially we see edema then there is a formation of some hyaline membrane interstitial inflammation and fibrosis though fibrosis we say by the age uh, by the 21 days is set in but there are a lot of research nowadays that it might take a lot of years also for the fibrosis and we have learned that lesson through the covid because initially we used to say there is an uh, i have to take this call for a second so these are the usual uh, stage line of this uh, natural history of ards so you can see initially you will have edema hyaline membrane formation interstitial inflammation and in fibrosis so once you understood that the pathophysiology of ards depends upon this things and you got a pneumonia or whatever it is and then you have an ards established you have a criteria that uh, without it so you can diagnose the ards on nrm you can diagnose the nr uh, and on non invasive or invasive ventilation there are different management strategies what we know is what we call as baby lung ventilation optimal peep low tidal volume and uh, uh, generous oxygen or try to keep the oxygen around 60 to 70 then we do uh, some recruitment maneuvers different modes of ventilation we'll talk briefly about it we do allied things which helps like uh, neuromuscular blocker prone positioning i know ecmo and so neuromuscular blocker should be non ventilatory and another fluid diuretics are the blood transfusion emodias treatment for non ventilatory we'll talk about it so as we know there are two principles which are very important provide adequate gas exchange and avoid secondary injury because nowadays we are talking a lot about what we called as uh, secondary lung injury or ventilatory associated lung injury and we have to make all the attempts that our ventilation is as physiological and as safe to the patient uh so uh so as we know every anything more than excess is kind of a poison or toxic or lethal so same thing here uh, we know that uh, we are talking a lot about oxygenation oxygenation but remember a lot of oxygen is also not good for the child and same thing has been told differently by lin martin so what are the principles as we saw uh, for supporting the respiration is we have uh, oxygen administration non invasive ventilation so initially we start low flow high flow oxygen then we have non invasive ventilation then we go to invasive ventilation where we have conventional mode we have advanced mode and ultimately everything else we go on ecmo so there are some protocols uh, this is our article given by marini and gattinoni uh, both of them are really acclaimed the respiratory physiologist and intensivist and it involves a different but it doesn't mean that we need to follow this criteria or flow chart we can have our, in our own also in the unit so uh, okay so what happens is when you classify ards and see whether the 
patient is uh, kind of an opted or having some neurological disturbance or gcs is low if it is yes then you should intubate and minimize the efforts if they are not there are they they can have a good respiratory drive then you can think about non invasive ventilation see how is the stability able to tolerate how is the abg oxygenation if those things are good then continue if those things are not good you intubate and minimize the effort and once this keep on improve, uh, improving then you see uh, how they are they are readiness for the ventilator uh, discontinuation if they are doing good then you discontinue if they are not going good uh, then you see what other things are contributing for this uh, weaning failure here uh, what you do you intubate minimize depending upon what kind of ventilatory strategies you wanted to use you choose them you choose the mode of ventilation keep on ventilating adjust your peep optimize your peep keep your tidal volume low and see whether the child is improving or not see, here you start using your non ventilatory management like fluid blood steroid if you wanted to use prone position all those things with the initial management if there is no improvement then the second modality is proning and if the proning is also not helping out then you think about a uh, different modes of ventilation and ultimately ecmo so what are the rescue therapies uh, i would say uh, uh, again uh, what it means by the rescue is you are trying to ventilate the uh, ards patient but simultaneously taking care of the conditions which are actually giving rise to ards and you are using the allied therapy so you have ventilatory management where you do a combination of uh, two things like as i told you uh, optimal p as well as low tidal volume ventilation low tidal volume at this moment all over the world we are accepting less than 6 ml per kilo there are small other thing humidification peep titration uh, recruitment maneuvers all those you see then you have a positioning you actually think about prone positioning in the first two hour first two days if the things are not improving for 16 hours then supportive measures and then you have infection control these are the things which are contributory for the better management of ards so uh, pediatric ards classification so uh, what are the triggers so when we think about non invasive ventilation these are the different triggers used by different this is the paper published in ngm according to the age they have used different triggers where we can actually initiate the non invasive ventilation so basically what they identified at the end is mild to moderate respiratory distress when the things are worsening in the first 6 hours you can think about starting the non invasive ventilation where tachypnea is more and you are going into the yellow to the red zone because you can see the things are worsening here and hypoxemia despite giving a standard oxygen therapy what is happening you are not able to maintain the saturation more than 92 it is also a definition of respiratory failure then you think about high flow cpap or niv mode of ventilation and remind it as we to to uh, talked about it these are the patient at risk of going to the frank ards so we need to intervene early similar those guidelines this this guidelines in the paper of prds came through this that these are the risk factors for going on uh, or risk factor for pediatric ards which includes uh, depends upon non mechanical ventilation and invasive ventilation that means you are on nasal mask cpap bipap and you are requiring more than 40% fio2 or high flow where the flow rate is increasing or the non invasive ventilation your oi is staying between 4 to 5 which is at the borderline Uh, so you can consider early niv when the kids are at risk of prds and we saw uh, which kids are actually at the risk of prds and how to identify them and non invasive ventilation is actually not recommended in a severe cases and even if you are starting we need to keep the things ready for intubating them so that we are not breaking the time there are a lot of other thing associated with niv you can't give it really for longer time you have to if the child is very labile then you have to remove it For, uh, the child is very labile and to give a some kind of a time to the nasal part sorry uh, nasal mucus at one minute okay. so if you need to give some time to the nose and the mouth we need to remove it and if they are not able to tolerate that things goes down and it is associated with lot of problems like skin background gastric distension barotrauma because you are not able to regulate and check the temperature uh, pressure which is going into the lung so how to choose appropriate niv again depends upon your unit what is an available equipment what kind of a ventilator you have whether you use hfnc more than niv 
nurses are comfortable or not what is your preference how you want to monitor them interface are nicely available you have what age you are dealing with what is the primary etiology whether the child is having uh, encephalopathy or not all those things will decide about what mode or what kind of a treatment you want to choose when we called when we start niv when you call it's a success so when you have reduction in the respiratory rate you have less retraction child started improving you are breathing well you are maintaining the gas exchange sensorium is better and x ray is getting better oxygenation is getting better but what is a work of breathing niv failure that you are requiring more than 8 of peep fio to more than 60% poor gas exchange hemodynamic instability work of breathing is high that means the things are not going in a good direction and we need to intubate them early so escalation to invasive ventilation increased respiratory rate work of breathing gas exchange and consciousness these are the common thing we usually use for intubating this patient when we start niv so how it goes so when we think about non invasive ventilation we have hfnc cpap bipap niv and usually we try to keep in this non invasive ventilation where pf ratio is less than 300 sf ratio is 264 but mainly non invasive when we go to the invasive ventilation it could be smb prvc we are talking about mild ardia that is oi between 4 to 8 and osi between 5 to 7.5 when we go to the advanced mode basically when we are talking about more uh, moderate ardias we start utilizing aprv ventilation uh, proning and all those thing kind of a things where the oi is between 8 to 16 this is a escalating ladder i would say similarly here comes the role of lot of other things when we are dealing with more ideas moderate ardias high frequency oscillatory ventilation self captain steroid and aprv ultimately when you reach to the severe ardias when the oxygenation index is more than 16 we might consider ecmo okay so what are the different ventilatory guidelines when we are talking about prds ventilation mode if you see in any of the ardias no mode proven superior to other so whatever you are comfortable if it is could be psi and prvs we can start and continue second thing is target tidal volume so we know that uh, we have to use low targeted volume low tidal volume because to press, uh, decrease the ventilatory induced lung injury but if you see the research it doesn't suggest or it has a weak agreement but most of the time we all use between 4 to 6 ml per kilo flat plateau pressure ultimately any plateau pressure so we have two pressure peak pressure and plateau pressure peak pressure is like whatever maximum pressure this plateau is after the gases get disturbed distributed in the lung then you get a plateau pressure so we always try to keep it less than 28 and if the 20 it goes more than 28 then we think about other strategies in the form of proning or early proning or high frequency oscillatory ventilation peak we try to keep it between 12 to 15 depending upon the lung recruitment and uh, compliance so this is also weak agreement so we are talking a lot about ip but this is not proven high frequency again when the plateau pressure goes goes more than 28 again it is a weak agreement so it doesn't improve the mortality cuff tube definitely cuff pt tubes are very important and it has a strong agreement when you are talking about guidelines spo2 target when you see a peep less than 10 to target saturation between 92 to 97 but once you go peak more than 110 you should target anything between 88 to 92 there is a strong agreement so that's why most of the ards unit or patient in the unit we try to maintain the saturation more than 88 for this you hypercapnia we should accept ph around 7.15 to 7.30 but there is no proven benefit of it but if the pco2 is increasing but the ph is more than 7.25 most of the time we don't do because if we try to do something to remove the co2 it's going to damage the lung now what about various mode of ventilation so conventional ventilation we have inverse ratio ventilation when we have aprv in high frequency so what happens in the mean airway pressure in the inverse ratio ventilation because we are increasing the i time your map is increased APRV, which is mass increase, it's almost like an almost more than an inverse ratio ventilation. So MAP is really increased, and MAP corresponds with uh, oxygenation. High frequency, you keep the MAP for longer time, so it is much increased. So these are the three things we do it. Spontaneous breathing is allowed in APRV. Usually in high frequency, they can take a couple of breaths, but we don't allow them. In inverse ratio ventilation, you can have a trigger breath as compared as high uh, conventional ventilation. 
high frequency require a very heavy sedation because we don't want anything there aprv as we allow them to breathe so not required inverse ratio ventilation and this one most of the time we require a good sedation autopy uh, very common in aprv the reason is we are allowing uh, what we call spontaneous breathing high frequency if they are breathing then yes conventional ventilation is less common and inverse ratio is very common because you have reduced the expiratory time so there is a very less time for the expiration high frequency definitely is an alternative there are a lot of units use early high frequency when the saturations are not maintaining and your peak pressures or plateau pressure is going more than 28 and this is also a very good mode of ventilation when we are dealing with the ards patient with air leaks there are multiple air leaks all there is a pulmonary interstitial emphysema then you think about high frequency early than the late what is an so this is an uh, pv loop uh, pressure volume loop so what is happening is uh, this is an inflecting arm where uh, your lung is kind of a, you say uh, there is no change in the volume with the change in the pressure this is pressure this is volume so from zero you are going to 30 on the pressure arm but if you see change in the volume is nothing after this what is happening with the small change in the pressure or change of a pressure between this two is 20 there is a significant change in the volume okay and after that what is happening is now even if i increase pressure more from 38 to 30 33 to 38 there is not much change in the volume you can see there is a little change in the volume that means this is the sweet zone okay this is called lower inflection point this is an upper inflection point this is over distension that means whatever the pressure i am giving it is not causing any change in the volume i am actually trying a more stress on the lung and this is a spot where we need to ventilate them below that lungs are collapsed below above this lungs are over distended and we need to keep the lung in this zone to reduce the lung injury what about recruitment maneuver so there are uh, the what are this recruitment maneuver is before starting the ventilation or immediately after starting the ventilation we try to recruit as much alveoli as possible or we try to get the utilize this kind of a total lung capacity so there are different way we can do recruitment maneuvers we can do on the inflecting arms so we can do a recruitment maneuver on this arm and this arm also uh, but there are manual and ventilatory recruitments like manual recruitments what they say 30 for 30 seconds or in adults they say 40 for 40 seconds that means you dial up the peep to 30 on ventilator and see whether the child is hemodynamically stable heart rate blood pressure everything has been maintained there is no air leak and all those things so you put the pressure on 30 uh, i am talking about pwp and wait there for 30 seconds and any point of time there is a hemodynamic instability you stop this and after that after going on 30 you start with the optimum pressure it's not like that once you do 30 for 30 you start with the peep of 5 so this is manual recruitment when you on the ventilatory recruitments you keep on increasing the p so most of the time we do it in the volume control uh, where we keep on increasing the p and after increasing the sorry pressure control when we keep on increasing the p at p a maximum p where there is a less peak pressure less plateau pressure more compliance and a good hemodynamic stability and a good pv curve we accept that as a uh, uh, that we have reached an appropriate recruitment pressure and from here we should keep it so it is very important in ards lung because it will actually get more and more lungs into the ventilation and those many collapsed lungs will be help to restore the functional residual capacity and improve lung compliance so this is the way you can see at zero lung is completely collapsed okay this is an actual lung at four little bit inflated eight more inflated 12 again more 16 more and here actually you can see at 20 what is happening is this is just ballooning and at 20 what is happening is we are between 16 to 20 we are actually over distending the lung and when we come back same thing what is happening is you can remember we inflection so we keep on increasing the pressure but now we reached here and now we came down on the pressure from 20 to 16 but this 16 is better than this 16 you can see then again from 16 we reduce the pressure to 12 this 12 is better than this 12 that means by doing this i used what are the collapse alveoli i tried to utilize them and now even at the lower pressure than this i am able to keep the lung open c8 which was completely collapsed it was still still better 
four again still better so this is what we did is we opened up the alveolar now we are requiring less pressure to keep them open so as i told lower inflection and upper inflection point uh, this is a curve uh, pressure volume curve uh, and this is called as open lung ventilation strategy what happens is we try to use less tidal volume uh, more peep and try to see uh, what exactly happens into the ventilatory parameters and this is one of the study uh, when the concept of open lung came open lung means like a baby lung or keep the peep high and use the less tidal volume so here we used uh, approximately 4 to 8 ml per kilo and what has happened is definitely the fio2 requirement was low in open lung ventilation strategy as compared to the control ventilation strategy so non conventional ventilatory strategies non conventional means uh, there are other things which we use in this patient so one of them is aprv so what happens in aprv we have a low and high pressure and and the child can breathe in between here basically inspiration is more expiration is low and what happens is in between the things uh, the, there would be can be a flow change depending upon with the uh, child or patient is breathing in between so and you can use a baseline cpap or bipap depending upon your patient here the spontaneous breathing will be promoted Uh, but the only thing here is there can be a CO two retention, and most of the time it all depends upon whether it it's the lung is really bad and it helps sometimes. So where do you use APRV in this patient when uh, you don't uh, you you really wanted to uh, manage this patient on conventional ventilation and don't go on high frequency? Uh, you can use in moderate as an early. There are units who are very comfortable with APRV and they use it early. and we can think about when we use early we can reduce the progression which is not uh, proven we need to know that they should not have a bad air leaks because here we use very high pressures to keep it open and we allow spontaneous breathing but if the air leak is there it might get exacerbated so there are other things which are actually helpful in this uh, as we say non ventilatory or something related to the ventilation so we have a inhaled nitric oxide at this moment is no uh, recommended for routine use but when you have a severe pulmonary atrial hypertension or rv dysfunction it is really 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 helpful and just bridge to an ecmo just before starting an ecmo or you wanted to avoid ecmo you can use inhaled nitric oxide and see the effect of inhaled nitric oxide you will see in a couple of uh, not couple of hours probably 30 minutes and if it is not helping you can stop also surfactant so it is not recommended so there is a negative strong recommendation so don't use it prone positioning at this moment there are no studies which has showed that prone positioning improves the outcome but we have seen definitely it achieves the physiological outcome that is oxygenation will be better so extended proning at this moment in a moderate to severe ards is recommended suctioning open or closed uh, there is no difference between the two but then the unit where the infection control policies are really strict we use closed suctioning chest physiotherapy not routinely recommended when they are on a very high settings so in the improving phase you can start steroid at this moment not recommended but there is a trial going on for the moderate to severe ards whether we can use the steroid early stem cell therapy again strongly not recommended so this is an ards and surfactant then what most of them has found that it is there is no improvement in the oxygenation proning a very good tool to manage this ards patient but there are a lot of things we need to take care when we are proning and we have to make it sure that we have a unit where the nurses are trained to take care of this prone patient and it's an absolute contraindication in the spinal injury hemodynamic instability cardiac rhythm disturbances and the child who is very sick it is it is contraindicated because if you near really need to do a cardio pulmonary resuscitation you need to pro supine this child proning uh, there are different mechanism which is helpful blood distribution to the better ventilated area so it is not like that in a supine uh, so we'll see this here so the difference chest, chest wall compliance is better uh, when we are prone and we tend to use different alveoli which are actually collapsed in prone position we open them up uh, one minute i need to take this call so proning there is a redistribution of blood redistribution of fluid and gases which result in a better vq uh, rather than having a vq mismatch we try to use more and more uh, collapsed airway which were not using 
there is a heart nearby so it actually keep on pumping so probably provide some kind of a vibrations to the lung which helps in a gas exchange uh pleural pressure is more uniformly dis uh, distributed we have a less atelectasis and less hyperinflated area and uh diaphragm motion also is regional diaphragm motion is also changed in a prone position and so ultimately it help in oxygenation so gravity improvement matching of perfusion and ventilation improvement is immediate you will see uh decrease shunt po2 improves and though we are not able to uh, say that there is an improvement in the outcome so you can see this patient which was supine now made into prone what has happened is PO2 PCO2 ratio went up, but once there is not much of an increase in the PCO2, but after keeping them prone and then again you made it supine, their PO2 from baseline went up, which was initially 200 went to almost like 300 and 350. So this is a very good example that we can achieve better result with the proning. So this is uh, the prone positioning severe ARDS. Okay, this is not mild moderate. This is severe ARDS, and what I have seen is. It is significantly improved the outcome in prone position. So over the time, there are different evidences, but at this moment in moderate to severe ARDS, we are actually extending the benefit of C, uh, proning, extended proning for 16 hours. So non-pulmonary treatments, we have sedation. So most of the time, sedation is dependent upon patient. It doesn't improve the outcome. But once we go on a severe ARDS, one thing which actually definitely helps is neuromuscular blocker and a good sedation. Nutrition, as like other patients, we need to make it sure they have a very good high protein rich diet. Fluid, uh, uh, fluid management is really important. We have to keep them dry, keep them kind of a, on the drier side. Don't let the fluid to accumulate so that the lungs are really in the best shape and there is no increased lung water. Transfusion, uh, usually we try to keep it more than seven, but when we are dealing with the severe ARDS and hemodynamically unstable, we try to keep it more than nine. Uh, arterial line for ARDS patient is recommended steadily because we need to check them. What about ECMO? When we landed up in a situation where uh, we are on maximum possible extent, our oxygenation index is more than 20. Theoretically, sometimes they said more than 30. And early phase of the worsening phase, our MAP or a plateau pressure is more than 28. FI2 requirement is more than 100. So then this is an indication where we should consider early ECMO because if we keep on doing that, we are damaging the lung and probably we will not be able to save this lung ultimately. A lot of monitoring is very important in this kind of a patient. So we need to keep on monitoring the, uh, we have a monitor which heart rate, respiratory rate, saturation, blood pressures. We should have an invasive blood pressure monitoring. Urine output is very important. Intake and output. We have to keep on regulating uh, uh, pressures on the ventilator so that it doesn't go more than 28 and it's not causing much of an injury. If the lungs started improving, we should be able to identify it and reduce the pressure accordingly. Keep the oxygen as less as possible. Try the saturation more than 8, 87 as your target, 88, 87 is target. And when you are proning, make it sure that you are able to I know there is one. We are able to do that. Okay. So few things: uh, the peripheral uh, venous blood gas sampling is not recommended in ARDS. If there is a capnography, which is really important, you can have uh, to have an arterial line isn't good. Weaning uh, again, it's uh, itself is a big topic. But whenever you feel the primary disease under control, you are on the good curve of the disease and saturations are maintained, then you can think about weaning it down. Most of the time, we try to come down on the FIO2 to 60% and then start coming down on the pressure. So, uh, case scenario, there is an 11-month-old baby girl uh, admitted with rapid breathing for two days. Uh, there is no feature suggestive of adverse perinatal event, uh, prior illness, hospitalization. Rapid breathing was preceded by two days of fever, urine, not taking feeds and so this was an x-ray you can see uh, a little, like this is the silhouting of the right middle zone and upper zone is also simultaneously dome of diaphragm right little bit right up there is no effusion as such so we can have a right sided consolidation so what things we will do it so what has happened here is here again same thing it's an early idea so you can think about high frequency heated high flow cpap bipap rather than going to this so on day one started on high flow, then 
PF ratio was 260, stabilized at 50% FiO2, and work of breathing improving. On day two, continued on high flow, PF ratio improved, been down to 40%, switched to nasal from oxygen. On day third, been out of oxygen, started prolus observation, what will be done? So case two here, the child who had juvenile dermatomyositis on the last six months on immunosuppressive therapy, progressive work of breathing for four days, severe work of breathing in room air saturation, is so almost respiratory failure. And you can see the X-ray worsening like a flash. You are intubated here, the things are really bad. So most likely this kind of a picture we usually see in secondary or indirect ARDS. So what would you do here is, you are not gonna actually think about, so we started using non-invasive ventilation, uh, then we went into non-invasive pressure control ventilation. There are increasing uh, requirement of uh, oxygen with the PF ratio of 120. The things here we are actually uh, might consider invasive ventilation because OI was almost seven. So invasive ventilation was considered. So invasive APRV mode was tried in this patient because going into the moderate ARDS, we gave steroid surfactant plus and minus, but again, there are no roles of this. And oxygenation index was almost reached to 18 and then the OPRV mode was started. So uh, Martin Tobin, I don't know if you know about Martin Tobin. Martin Tobin was an editor of New England Journal of Medicine. He was an amazing guy. He's a philosopher. He had a lot of work related to ARDS and patient clinical interaction. So what he said, we must discard the old approach and continue to search for ways to improve mechanical ventilation. We are just stuck there. We are not doing any good thing here. In the meantime, there is no substitute for the clinician standing by the ventilator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parag, for uh, yet another interesting and elaborate and easy presentation of ARDS. Ah, switch mute or mute. Uh, not mute. Bravo. Okay. So uh, there are a few questions by Jana pediatricians on the group. As per them, uh, at what stance they should be referring patient for ECMO? If we have, if they have identified ARDS, they don't have exclusive setup to manage. But uh, if they want to refer them while they are managing it. What are the earlier pointers to tell them that, okay, this patient is ideally should be managed on ECMO? Okay, when on ventilator, your peak pressure, plateau pressure is going more than 22 to 24 and FIO2 requirement is more than 60%, you should ask to send the child for higher center where the ECMO facilities are there. And if you really wanted to keep this kind of a patient, whenever your plateau pressure is going more than 28, and if I have to requirement is more than 60%, you should immediately send because these are the center where you require high frequency, inhaled nitric oxide. And remember, there is no fun of starting ECMO after seven days. All patients who required ECMO after seven days, they have a high chances of mortality. So when if we wanted to consider ECMO, we have to consider in the early phase when they are relatively better. Because if you keep on managing this patient, no, no, they are maintaining oxygenation and ultimately they get a benefit. So, the whole fun of starting ECMO is to reduce the lung injury. But if we are using too much of pressure and causing the lung injury, even if you send after seven days for ECMO, probably you won't do ECMO because it is not helping the child. The lung has already damaged. So before seven days, when your pre pressures or plateau pressures are reaching 20, 22, and FiO2 is more than 60%, you should send to the center where there is a high frequency, inhaled nitric oxide and ECMO. So uh, basically, to the contraindications are if the time has passed and multi-organ dysfunction has set in, there is no much role of ECMO, right? They, they, but we should not take like that. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say is always when we think about ECMO, we should think about reversible condition. So there is no absolute contraindication for ECMO. Even if after seven days you send, we'll put the child on ECMO, but the results will be a little bit bad. The only contraindication for ECMO, there is a primary IC bleed or very bad multi-organ failure. There is an end organ injury, uh, acute kidney injury, which is really bad, requiring CRIT. Then I will consider 10 times before putting the child on ECMO. What should be the fluid uh, therapy and what should be the starting fluid in uh, peripheral setups when we are dealing all, with... All patients should have a DNS. 
and they should start with 70 to 80 percent maintenance and try to keep the negative balance they should not allow in a day a positive balance more than 20 ml per kilo so for sake of an example in a 10 kg child the target fluid balance in a case of pneumonia who is now not getting better maximum positive balance what we should tolerate is 200 ml yes we should tolerate, but most of the time we should not let it go to the positive. We should try to keep it like 100 ml negative or 200 ml negative. Any specific strategy in your unit you are using to take to keep this target? So every six hourly you keep on checking the intake and output. So if you 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 wanted to keep it uh, 200 negative, so every six hourly make it sure that they are six for 50 ml negative. So let it be they become. 300 ml positive so if the hemodynamically stable you can consider giving a bolus of lasix or you can reduce the in, uh, intake so that next hour you can uh, you can get a more negative balance so lasix are indicated only if there is positive fluid balance not regularly and not uh, no, no. a lot is absolutely not regularly recommended lasix is when you have a pulmonary edema or it could be a secondary pulmonary edema or you wanted to get rid of fluid that indeed otherwise lasix is not indicated what about bolus lasix versus infusion lasix? It itself is a big deal. Uh, it's it's so. If you ask me, I like uh, uh, infusion lasix better than bolus because it's a constant concentration dependent action. So if you gave a bolus, then you can't regulate. That once you give a bolus, that child might be one liter, two liter, three liter, ten liter. We don't know. So you can't really regulate. But if you start infusion, you know that consistently child is giving three ml, four ml per kilo urine output. So you can predict. So I believe uh, infusion more than bolus, but there is no literature which suggests. When we choose inotropy in case of child with cardiac compromised state along with uh, ARDS, is combination of adrenaline plus dobutamine uh, a relevant uh, combination or should dobutamine, we always... Dobutamine is a useless medication. Okay, so you have to use physiology specific inotropes. Most of the time, any of the unit, adult, pediatric, the choice of inotropes depending upon the physiology is epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine. And, but if you have a normal blood pressure and you're dealing with the pulmonary arterial hypertension, then you can think about milrinone, not dobutamine. Those units which don't have experience with milrinone, can they still use dobutamine? You can use low-dose epinephrine, less than 0 0.05 uh, microgram per kilo per minute. That itself is afterload reducing that will help like a dobutamine. Okay. Less than 0 0.05 microgram per kilo per minute. Less than 0 0.05 microgram per kg per minute. It has a. If you are not understanding anything, na, just start epinephrine 0 0.05 microgram per kilo per minute. What about putting in catheter and uh, is catheter useful enough for managing sick child in your opinion? If you are ventilating, put a catheter. If you are an inotropes, put a catheter. If you are dengue, put a catheter. So that we can titrate fluid input and output. Yes. Meticulously. If you are really worried about not that, use a condom catheter. And uh, the rationale behind uh, good fluid input output is already being highlighted. And uh, there are no questions on the group, but these were the set of questions which were already been asked by the fellows and students. And uh, even if they are not in the group, I have already asked them. They will be looking at uh, the video. Also, I would like to tell all the participants that on 1st of July, Dr. Parag will be will be conducting safe systemic approach to ventilation in emergencies, and uh, that workshop is in uh, is will be giving you hands on on uh, various clinical emergencies along with uh, very much systemic approach to various clinical conditions in PICU. In Hyderabad, those who wish to register can register and can contact Dr. Parag or me. And uh, if there are any questions, please ping me directly. Thank you, Parak, sir, for taking out time. And uh, you always make difficult topics very easy. Thank you. Thank you once again. Take care. Okay.